come with us on a musical journey through some of the most magnificent places on earth. Great towns and cities of Europe, steeped in history and beauty, and resounding with the stories and music of the world's great composers. Mozart, Bach, Beethoven, Grieg, Vivaldi, Tchaikovsky. Just some of the greats in our classical destinations. Hello, I'm Simon Callow. Welcome to Classical Destinations. We'll be taking some journeys to some of the most beautiful cities and landscapes in Europe, the homes and inspirations of the greatest classical composers, seeing where they lived and how they lived can transform the way we hear their music. Welcome to Classical Destinations. I'm Matt Wills. And I'm Nikki Vasilakis. And this is Lake St. Wolfgang, Austria. Today, we'll be visiting the towns Mozart went to and through on his journeys between Salzburg and Vienna. And we'll also be visiting the picture-perfect town of Eisenstadt. St. Wolfgang is situated on Lake Wolfgang in the resort area called the Salzkammergut, about 50 kilometers east of Salzburg. Home of the famous White Horse Inn and surrounded by the Austrian Alps, it's where the opening scenes of the film The Sound of Music were filmed. Just the right destination for a series about music, really, especially when you consider that St. Wolfgang and the nearby town of St. Gilgen were the home turf of Mozart's mother and her family. In such a glorious setting, it's no wonder that Leopold and Anna Maria Mozart should name their only son after their beloved St. Wolfgang. A trip to Salzburg is incomplete without visiting St. Wolfgang and the surrounding Lake District. Mozart wasn't the only composer to have connections with this part of the world. On nearby Lake Attersee, the largest lake exclusively in Austria, the village of Steinbach was a welcome retreat for Gustav Mahler in the 1890s. At the time, Mahler was living in Hamburg, Germany, but found that the hectic pace of the city and the madness of the theatre season wasn't really conducive to the creative process. The Gasthof zum Hollengebirge in Steinbach solved his problem. Though the inn was beautiful and peaceful in its own right, Mahler built this small composing cottage by the lake where much of his work was written. In fact, he was known as the vacation composer. You can still stay at the inn and spend some time enjoying these exquisite locations and visit Mahler's hut. The countryside between Salzburg and Vienna is some of the most picturesque in Europe. The city of Linz is capital of the state of Upper Austria and one of the country's major industrial centres, but even so retains a unique charm. Mozart never lived in Linz, though he often passed through here with his family before crossing the river Danube by ferry. In 1783, Mozart and his wife Constanza visited Linz on their way back to Vienna from Salzburg. They'd planned on spending only a night, but in the end stayed three weeks as guests of a Count von Thun, who lived in this house. While here, Mozart composed his symphony number 36, K425, known as the Linz Symphony. The Linz Symphony was appropriately first performed in the Linz Theatre a matter of days after it was finished in 1783. On the way to Vienna, we pass the town of Melk, with its imposing Benedictine Abbey, Stift Melk, founded in 1089. 
The Mozart family stayed here on two occasions, in 1767 and 1768, as they took the precocious pre-teen Wolfgang on long musical tours through Europe. Further down the Danube is the stunning little village of Dürnstein, perfectly situated on a picturesque fork in the Danube River. From Dürnstein, it's only a short drive to the country's capital, Vienna, seat of the Austrian Habsburg dynasty for hundreds of years and home to more of the great classical composers than you can wave a bat on at. Vienna was originally a Roman outpost that was leveled by the barbarians in the 5th century AD. Charlemagne then resurrected it in the late 8th or early 9th centuries. The Babenberg Dukes were installed by Holy Roman Emperor Otto III in 976 and ruled Austria for nearly 300 years. Vienna grew into one of the major trading centers of the Holy Roman Empire. As the Babenberg's rule faded, a new order came to power. The Habsburgs seized control over Austrian lands in 1278 and stayed for over 600 years. The empire eventually expanded to cover much of Eastern Europe, its 51 million subjects speaking 15 languages. This is the Hofburg, or Imperial Palace. It was originally a medieval castle, but as the Habsburg's power and influence grew, so did the palace. It remains one of the most imposing structures in Europe and dominates the center of Vienna. They were a clever lot, those Habsburgs. What kept them going longer than most other ruling families in Europe was that rather than making over-vigorous use of the sword to gain their lands, they employed the more subtle arts of marriage and diplomacy. This goes a long way to explaining the wealth and depth of art, music and architecture that has become Vienna's heritage into the 21st century. In the middle of the 19th century, Emperor Franz Joseph I, the last Habsburg Emperor, ordered that the walls of the city be torn down. In its place today is the broad boulevard known as Ringstrasse, or just the Ring. The Ring is four kilometers long, encircling the city center. Taking a tram round the Ring provides one of the better instant Viennese tours. Every great city has a park, and in Vienna, it's Stadtpark, right on the ring, and home to the famous gilt statue of Johann Strauss, Jr. Here we have the University of Vienna. It's actually one of the oldest in Europe, founded in 1365. And amazingly, it's been home to something like nine Nobel Prize winners. The 99-meter central tower of the city hall, or Rathaus, is surmounted by the Rathausmann, a knight in shining armor. It all looks quite medieval, but the architecture is actually neo-Gothic, dating from just 1883. The late 19th century Museum of Fine Arts has one of the world's richest and most important art collections, courtesy of the Habsburgs, including works by Rubens, Rembrandt, Vermeer, Dürer, Raphael, Titian, Velasquez, and more Bruegels than anywhere else in the world. And Vienna is famous for its coffee shops and for the vast array of different coffees they provide. This town was mecca for musicians over the 18th, 19th and early 20th centuries. It was here where Schubert played piano at some great parties, where Beethoven first noticed that someone was turning the volume down, and where Mozart wrote hundreds of pieces of music over the course of his last nine years. 
Built in the style of the Italian Renaissance, the Vienna State Opera House was completed in 1869, and attending a performance here while in Vienna is a must. Do try to book before, though, to avoid disappointment. One of the principal dancers of the Vienna State Ballet is Gabor Oberegger, who showed classical destinations through the Vienna Opera House. You know, the Viennese um, way of life is quite relaxed. People like to stay in a coffee house. And uh, it's somehow the same with ballet, you know. If you do the Viennese waltz, you don't have to be too correct. It's sometimes a bit behind the music. This little tiny bit of incorrectness is maybe what makes it so special. The Opera House is famous for a number of good reasons. First class opera and ballet performances, the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra, and for the people that have performed here. Gustav Mahler was chief conductor here for 10 years. Those 10 years that Mahler spent at the opera were among the most famous in its history. He was by all means one of the most famous conductors in the world at the time. Only Toscanini could possibly have equaled him. But despite these impressive musical skills, the obsessive perfectionist Mahler was by no means the most diplomatic of managers, which is a pretty important skill when you're running an opera house with almost hundreds of people underneath you. He expected to control every aspect of what happened on stage. He was particularly interested in the look of a production, which was not at that time considered to be the province of the conductor at all. The rising tide of anti-Semitism in Vienna at the time didn't help his popularity either, even though he'd actually converted to Catholicism in order to get the job. As we don't remember Mahler so much for his conducting, he left no recordings behind, but for those vast symphonies of his, which are now in the repertory of every major conductor and every major orchestra, the symphonies which seem to attempt to embrace the whole of human experience. His, his very first symphony, which he called The Titan, written in 1888, while still in his 20s, manages to contain despair, failed love, love of nature, transcendence, cheek by jowl with vulgarity, street music, a funeral march, which is really a sardonic version of the children's tune, Frère Jacques, Titanic, indeed. It's no less than a catalogue of the whole of human existence. Now that is ambitious. This unassuming little apartment building was the birthplace of Franz Schubert in 1797. He's now regarded as one of Vienna's greatest sons, but this wouldn't have been too evident to him while he was alive, which wasn't for that long. His massive corpus of work, nine symphonies like his hero Beethoven, piano sonatas, a good 600 songs, and so much more, was written at speed before his death in 1828, aged only 31. Schubert spent the bulk of his life penniless and destitute, but he always seemed to remain enthusiastic about composing. It said that he went to bed with his glasses on so he could start composing as soon as he awoke. Like many before him, his work was not widely recognized until after his death. Schubert's family were devout Catholics and today their local church is called the Schubert Church. And this is one of his most famous works.
19th of November 1828, Franz Schubert died of typhoid fever in this very room at the age of 31. Music, like language, is fluid, and through the period of the lives of the great composers, it flowed from Baroque to classical to romantic and then to modern. But even as the river of music flowed, not all composers flowed with it. Johannes Brahms has been described as a rock of classicism in the onrushing stream of new styles, which were evident in the work of Wagner, Liszt and others. Born in 1833 in Hamburg in North Germany, Johannes Brahms' early experience as a musician certainly wasn't conventional or desirable. From the age of 13, he played piano in bars and bordellos. A slow and painstaking worker, he didn't complete his first symphony until he was 43. At the same age, Beethoven had written eight of his nine symphonies, and Mozart and Schubert were both dead. Brahms lived and worked in Vienna from 1862 until his death in 1897. Interestingly, the Brahms Memorial is contained within the house of one of his idols, Josef Haydn. It's a museum known as the Haydn House of Vienna. Brahms was devoted to the classical form. His great statement of faith was, if we cannot compose as beautifully as Mozart and Haydn, then let us at least compose as purely. When I was growing up and finding my way into classical music, Tastes were much more rigidly defined. There was, for example, something called the three Bs, which represented a kind of apostolic succession in music. Bach, Beethoven, Brahms. Brahms, I suppose, was the last of the great composers to really enter into the popular consciousness. Most people can hum his lullaby. Um, many people know a few of his Hungarian dances. In, in uh, Chaplin's great film, The Great Dictator, uh, Chaplin gives a customer, a rather frightened customer, a shave to the strains of Brahms's fifth Hungarian dance. He's also the only composer whose music has been conducted by Cary Grant in the film People Will Talk. It actually does rather well, making a reasonable fist of the academic festival overture. Aimez-vous Brahms was a question most people were very happy to answer in the affirmative, as well as two sublime and very different piano concertos, a violin concerto, a fascinating double concerto for violin and cello, a most unusual and difficult combination to write for, a huge output of chamber music and many, many, many songs, and choral music to boot. Brahms' central achievement are the four great symphonies. But he was terribly daunted by Beethoven's example, and it took him a long time to summon up the courage to write his own first symphony. He was actually 43 when he finally did. And of course, it was an instant classic, but he prepared himself very well for it by writing other extended orchestral pieces, like two uh, enchanting orchestral serenades, and climactically, the variations on a theme of Haydn. At least he thought it was a theme of Haydn. In fact, uh, uh, Haydn was one of his musical heroes, and he was very happy to associate his name with Haydn's. But uh, in reality, the tune is something called the St. Anthony Choral, whatever its name is. Brahms drew out of the old tune every single possibility in a work of extraordinary confidence and vitality. Franz Josef Haydn was born in Rohrau, Austria in 1732, the second of 12 children. The meager family finances were overstretched, so little Joseph was packed off to live with an uncle when he was not quite six years old. He studied the clavier, the violin, and the kettle drum, and was soon noticed by the Kapellmeister at St. Stephen's Cathedral in Vienna, who enrolled Haydn in what we now know as the Vienna Boys' Choir.
50 kilometers southeast of Vienna is the town of Eisenstadt, lying serenely on the southern slopes of the lighter mountains. It was a wonderful escape from the big smoke of Vienna for many. In the 14th century, a ruling family erected a fortified wall around the city and then built a citadel inside it. The family inherited the citadel, which was named Esterhazy Palace and is the town's centerpiece. In the 1740s, the rich classical tradition which would later die with Brahms was only just going through its birth pangs and Joseph Haydn would be one of its heralds. In 1749, age 17, Haydn's time with the Vienna Boys Choir came to an abrupt end when he was expelled for cutting off another chorister's pigtail and he was turned out into the streets. Straight away, he began to turn himself into a composer. This is the jewel of Esterhazy Palace, the 500-seat Haydnsaal, one of the most beautiful concert halls in the world with its Rococo frescoes and with what are said to be near-perfect acoustics. Just a five-minute walk from the palace down what is known as Haydn Lane is Eisenstadt's Haydn House. He lived here for 12 years, from 1766, with his wife, Maria Keller. Haydn was one of the most prolific of composers. He wrote and taught music nearly every working day. Most of his 25 operas, 85 of his 107 symphonies, and many of his 83 string quartets were written while he served as Kapellmeister to the Esterhazy family for nearly 30 years from 1761. In 1790, after the death of Prince Nicolaus Esterhazy, Haydn was free to travel and compose as he wished. Effectively retired from his duties at court, he accepted an invitation to travel to London. Before he left, Mozart said to Haydn, how will you survive in London where you don't speak the language and people don't know you? See this signature, he replied. That's all I need. The world knows my name. When Haydn returned to Austria in 1792, he taught a young student by the name of Ludwig van Beethoven. Much of Beethoven's work from this time shows the clear influence of Haydn. Finally, he came home to Vienna, where he stayed until his death in 1809. Haydn was known in Vienna as the Grand Old Man, or more affectionately, as Papa Haydn. In 1820, Haydn's remains were returned here to Eisenstadt, where he had lived and worked for so many years. It seems fitting that they are here in his beloved church, the Bergkirche, where he was first Weisskapellmeister, then Kapellmeister, and where, when he directed his own music, he played the organ. Haydn strikes me as having been a delightful man. He was certainly well loved by the Esterhazys and the people of this town. Yes, and his popularity in Vienna wasn't just because he was a great composer. He seemed to be well loved as a man. Thanks, Matt and Nicky, for that look at one of classical music's most generous and good-natured composers. Next, we'll be meeting another one. Edvard Grieg, the Norwegian, composer of the great Pier Gint music, the piano concerto in A minor, and that immortal ballad, I Love Thee. His life took place against some of the most spectacular scenery you could ever hope to see in your life. That's next time in Classical Destinations. Meanwhile, goodbye from me, Simon Callow.